working. Yeah, hirelings. I said I would do it. Apparently, I'm doing it today. Spend a lot of time on it. Hmm, okay, come on, sound. Come on, video. Come on through. Am I live? Is things ticking over? I cannot tell. Come on, catch up. I've pressed the button and I'm still waiting. <clears throat> Nothing. Oh, an ad. Wix. No, I don't want Wix. I have no interest in Wix. How is it that I'm watching the ads as well? Okay. All right, welcome to uh, How to D&D. I am currently in the middle of just making sure everything is working correctly. It looks like it is, which is awesome. I'm quite happy about that. <laughs> now we're just going to check my screen just to make sure everything's working there as well. And, uh, and then we're ready to go. Now, if you haven't been part of my live streams before, normally I do put a start time down in the live stream so you can get past all of my ramblings and setup and so forth. <clears throat> if you want to catch up with the live stream later on, that's a bit difficult because all of my live streams are unlisted. And as a result of that, you will find you can't find them. You have to subscribe, hit the bell button and turn on notifications so that YouTube will actually let you know there is a live stream to watch. Okay. How's it going, Sam? Tom Miller. Hi, Miller. How's it going? It's been a while. Hi, Nicholas. Hi, Cameron. Okay, so uh, for those of you who don't really care about that, well, good news. I do have a Patreon page. Patrons get access to the unlisted live streams. And if you want the edited version, hi, John, uh, you can also get access to the edited version of this live stream in about three or four days when YouTube publishes it and I do all my bits and pieces. Okay, chances D&D Spellbook. Okay, chances. I know you. Um, for those of you who have no idea who Chances is, he has a YouTube channel, does videos on spells and other aspects of Dungeons and Dragons. Go and check out his stuff when you need to. Hi Nicholas, how's it going? Um, sound went mute, did it? Sorry, I messed up here. No, 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 you didn't mess up. I, I actually do need some feedback because currently I have a sock on my microphone. In, a, in an endeavor to try to get rid of the strange noises that have been occurring. I hadn't changed my setup very much, so I was thinking, well, what am I doing wrong? So I decided the solution to everything is to put a sock on it. Okay, now if you haven't been part of my live streams before, normally what I do with my live streams is I present everything first, I have my notes, and I will give you a whole bunch of slides, and then uh, once we're finished, I will go back to the webcam and you will see my face, surprise, and you can have a chat with me, uh, whether that be questions or feedback or just saying hi. All of that's fine. How's it going, Scott? All right. Okay. The room is full. It's time to get busy. Okay. Well, I'm glad. So the sock is working. <laughs> ah, dear, that's really funny. Sorry. I couldn't help myself. I have to laugh. It's, it is pretty funny. <laughs> I'm going to pull out my my headphones. All right, settle back, grab some food and some drink. Make sure you're comfortable because uh, this is a long haul. Uh, I have a lot of information. There are, <laughs> I'm going to apologize right now, there's four pages of notes. I have a lot of material. This happens. For those of you who don't realize on my channel, I talk a lot. Okay, let's start. Hi, welcome to How to D&D. My name is Fred Weller and today I want to talk about Dungeons and Dragons, because I always do talk about Dungeons and Dragons as it happens. Henchmen, or hirelings, or something like that. We're going to talk about how to use hirelings in Dungeons and Dragons 5e. I want to make it clear, this is not the complete video. This is just one of many, because there's no way I can talk about this topic in one video. Even for me, it's too much. Okay, so this video is going to cover hirelings, what they are, reference books, some suggested stat blocks, the costs of using or hiring a hireling, because of course you do have to actually pay money, and then of course we're going to talk about things like combat, how you could use them in combat, and utility functions, in very broad sense, rather than a deep dive. I'm not going to go into the pros and cons, or whether you should use them or shouldn't use them, I don't care about any of that really. I just want to give you as much information about those areas as I possibly can. So adventurers can pay a non-player character or NPC or a hireling, as you might say, to provide some sort of service, skill, to help them without 
having to sort of involve them in major aspects of role playing in your adventure. Now, of course, you could do that if you really wanted to, but the purpose of a hireling is really more a functional process rather than necessarily a role play uh, focus. That doesn't mean you could not do it that way if you wanted to. I'm just suggesting that's usually not the case. Okay, so these NPCs or non-player characters or hirelings, as you might want to say, can be controlled by the dungeon master or the players. I know that sounds confusing. I would recommend that you allow control be given over to the players with dungeon master oversight. So that's to stop your players from doing things like throwing the hirelings into the front line, getting them butchered like a red shirt, and then just going and buying another one. Which, of course, is going to be the tendency for some players. <clears throat> That's not really the purpose of this. It's moving on. So, reference material. Where are you going to find information in books about hirelings and how you can use them in your game? Well, the first port of call, which you probably should already know if you've done any research, is the Dungeon Master's Guide on page 92 through to 94. It's kind of sparse. There's not a lot there. Uh, it's a good starting point, but not complete. Then if you turn to the Monster Manual on pages 342 through to 350, you'll find a whole bunch of stat blocks that you could use as I hiling, or a sellsword, or a sidekick, or something like that. You could just use them as they are, or you could modify them, that's fine too. Next, the Player's Handbook. On page 159, how much does it cost to actually have a hireling is covered on that page. It's there. It's not an exact science. There is some discretion required by the dungeon master. You will have to make some decisions. Okay, next. I'm almost there. We're almost there. The Dungeons and Dragons Essentials Kit, the rule book, on pages 63 through to 64, has sidekick rules, yada, really useful actually, probably the more useful aspect out of all the references that I've given you so far. The last one out of my exhaustive list, list is Volo's Guide to Monsters on pages 209 through to 220, a bunch of stat blocks that you could use as an NPC or a hireling for your party. So there are your resources that you can start with. Now, let's talk about what you can use hirelings for in your game. Because that's really why you're here. No other reason, right? So what can you use hirelings for in your game? There's really two aspects. There is combat and there is utility. That's really pretty much everything. I suppose some people would say you could use them for role play, but I'm inclined not to do that sort of thing myself. That's not usually how I've used them in my game. It just generated more work for me if I were to even consider that, even if I had players that might want that. So the first one, let's start off with combat support. So stat blocks can be found in the Monster Manual and Volo's Guide to Monsters, as I said. How much does it cost to actually have somebody who's going to provide combat support? Well, about two gold pieces per day, roughly in that vein. They're more expensive because they're putting their life at risk, so they, they're going to charge more compared to some other hirelings that have a utility function. And why shouldn't they? They are risking their lives after all. Okay, so let's look at combat support. Our first aspect to for, um, combat support. And I have six things I want to say. First off, combat support usually consists of a hireling, but they can also be called a sellsword, or a henchman, henchwoman if you prefer that uh, term, uh, a companion, cohorts, retainers, sidekicks, but they all sort of function in the same way with regard to combat. They fall into four brackets. That is the warrior, who is going to be doing some sort of fighting up front or at range, depending on what you want. The mage, who casts spells of an arcane nature. The healer, who's casting some sort of divine spell, the expert who's really good at doing stuff, like any kind of skill you can think of, they're the person to go and uh, talk to. There are some pros and cons to using them in combat, 
but that is not this video. So we're going to move on. Then you have what's called a follower. And I consider a follower to be something like a squire, an acolyte, or an apprentice. An apprentice is probably a really good example, such as the sorcerer's apprentice, Mickey Mouse here. Uh, they have no cost. They just follow you around, do what you tell them to do, and generally are trying to learn from you. And of course, at some point, they will become a full-fledged whatever they are, okay? Now, why would we want to use something like a combat support NPC or hireling in our game? Well, usually it's going to be because the party is short on player characters. So what do you do? You go and hire somebody to help you out. Because what's better than three players? Four players. And what's better than four players? Five players. And why would you do that? So that as a dungeon master, you don't have to worry about modifying every single combat encounter that has been built for four to five player characters. An easy fix, right? Then what about those strongholds? Your players have got themselves a stronghold. They need guards. They need somebody to protect your stronghold, to keep the riffraff out, uh, possibly even keep them out when things go bad. Who knows? What about if they have a wagon train? They're traveling from one location, point A to point B. They've got a wagon train. You want to take somebody who can act as a guard, put them on a horse, don't make them walk. That's kind of ridiculous. And then, of course, one of the other aspects of having an, a hireling or a henchman or henchwoman is that you can utilize them for those disasters that can occur in your games from time to time. You need to replace a player character. They can be updated, these hirelings. They can be updated and replace the dead player character that occurred during your game. And of course, hopefully the body count is not too high. Therefore, you don't have to worry about bringing in too many different hirelings all at once. Okay, I'm just playing with you. All right, so let's talk about utility. This is where I think the, the best aspect of hirelings exists. That doesn't mean you can't use combat. Utility support. I would suggest using the commoner stat block. You can find that pretty much any, I mean the monster manual has it, you'll find it in a lot of adventures. It's easy to access on the SRD. And how much do they cost per day? Well, the rain, there's a huge range. It can start at two silver coins per day to right up to two gold coins per day. So you have to decide what level of skill they have that requires them to be paid whatever they're going to be paid. Um, I would suggest those who are doing something really impressive get paid more, and those who are doing something pretty menial get paid less. Very simple. Not much to it, really. Okay, let's talk about the numerous utility functions of a hireling. Let's start off with the porter. Why not a porter? Because somebody needs to carry something, right? Porters carry gear, equipment, they can carry an animal cage, if you've got to carry animal cages to go and grab some sort of creature without butchering it and bring it back to a zoo or something like that. Carrying food, if you have a lot of food you have to carry and you can't hunt because there's no food anywhere to be seen, you can't shoot animals, whatever. Uh, or you have to treasure, um, carry all those treasure chests. You fell in the treasure vault and you've got to carry it all back and you can't take a mule or a horse or some sort of pack animal with you. So what do you use? You use a pack person. <laughs> That's what the port is for. Okay, number two, let's look at the most common thing we're going to need, and that is the stable hand. Get yourself a stable hand. They can feed, groom, settle, secure, and keep the party's horses safe while they are camping and while they are traveling. And in particular, while the party are engaged in fighting, because that does happen from time to time. Number three, get yourself an explorer. That's an, an exploring guide, a wilderness guide. Somebody who can help the party not get lost or venture, let's say, avoid venturing into dangerous locations accidentally. Because that can happen sometimes, right? Accidentally is not what we want. Intentionally is what we want. All right, number four, the blacksmith, the armorer. That's somebody who can do the horseshoes, sharpen blades, forge or repair armor, 
shields, weapons. I know this is a dangerous location to start venturing into when we start talking about hirelings doing this sort of thing rather than the player's characters. Like I said, I'm not giving you a reason why or you should or should not do it. I'm just saying here are the options. Number five, the alchemist. Now you can brew beer. No, I'm only kidding. You could brew beer. You can brew those cheap potions that are available to the player characters for very specific purposes. Not just those potions of healing, which of course they probably want those, but all of the other things that you might allow your party to brew, should you be inclined to do so. Okay, here's my big, big list. The artisan. The artisan is somebody who has a skill, right? And they can be used to generate a stable income over time. You want to make money? How do you do it? You go adventuring or you have a bunch of hirelings that can produce something that makes money. That could be somebody who is a brewer making beer or ale. It could be a cobbler for making shoes, a cook for making food, run a restaurant, why not? Uh, glass blowers, farmers, farmers, that's pretty obvious. Masons, jewelers, leather workers, the carpenter, painters, potters, miners, if you're into mining, particularly if you're involved in the lost mine of Fandelda, sages who can collect and run a library for you, the tailor for making clothing, weavers, wood carvers, and if you're really on the edge and a bit on the grey side, maybe a spy system. Why not run a spy guild of some kind and get people to collect information for you? Okay, so number seven is the mage scribe. To allow you to transfer spells onto a scroll so you can cast those spells from the scroll rather than using those spell slots. Or what about creating a backup spell book or should I say backup spell books, multiple books, not just one but many books. You can already see there are quite a few different options available to hirelings uh, that are just utility based. And yes, some of them do sort of fall into the category of combat. Number eight, I am not finished, is the weapon valet, or valet, if you want to call it that way. I mean, I don't care. It's basically a guy or a person or a creature who carries all of the party's extra weapons and stuff. They might even be the one who has the bag of holding because it makes more sense. They have the bag of holding and they hand the stuff to whoever needs it when they need it. Why not? I think it's quite a good idea. Next is number nine. That is the campsite staff. That's right. You need a campsite staff member. They could also look after horses and sharpen weapons. Do the cooking. If you don't want to do the cooking, do the cleaning. Do the sentry duty, or at least some of the sentry duty, depending on how, how many campsite staff you have. If you have like four or five, then they can do all of that. But if you only have one, then that's a little bit different. You're going to have to sort of slide them into the roster somewhere. Number 10, what about the crew for a ship? That's right, what do they do? They sail the ship for the party, while the party go and do other things. They also keep it clean. So I like the idea of a ship's crew. And I think it's actually probably one of the more common things that we utilise. We call them NPCs. But in many cases, they're really a hireling. Number 11, one of my favourites, and that is the home base steward. This is somebody who does all the cleaning, restocking the supplies in the home base or the stronghold, commands the guards and tells them what to do and when they have to get up and when they have to go to sleep and when they have to eat and all that sort of stuff. And also the individual who answers the door when somebody comes to the door and collects the newspaper each day so that you can read it uh, at your dining table. Yes, Alfred is a good example of that. Number 12, the animal or dog master. This is somebody who makes sure the party dogs are fed, they are watered, they are cleaned, and they perform their sentry duty so that the party don't have to do it themselves. Dogs are probably better at it than the player's characters. Number 13. We were getting there. I told you it was a long list. The torchbearer. 
They stay in the middle of the party while they are adventuring. They provide light. It could be from a torch or better yet, use a lantern. Don't muck around with the light cantrip or a torch which doesn't generate that much light. Get somebody to actually carry a full blown lantern and then give them armor and a shield and just stick them in the middle of the party. Why not? I think it's quite a good idea. Makes far more sense. Gives you more visibility in darkness. Number 14. The Animal Companion. For hunting and tracking down whatever you need to track down. I would suggest going and seeing my video on Animal Companions because I have gone into this in a lot more detail in that video rather than in this video. And yes, I suppose you could say that an Animal Companion isn't necessarily a hireling. But I'm going to say, at some point, you've got to either find it or buy it. So I'm going to say yes. There's a bunch of people who are probably jumping up and down and saying, Fred, why have you not suggested anything regarding strongholds and followers? Well, I just did. You could go and check out that book if you want. But given that the whole book is dedicated very much to strongholds and followers, I'm not really going to suggest that you go and buy a book for just one purpose in your game. Unless, of course, it's going to play a huge factor in how you run your game in some way. Now, I'm hoping that this covered pretty much all the things you needed for today. And if it didn't, do not worry, because there will be more videos on the topic, because I'm the sort of person who tries not to make my videos an hour long, um, 10 to 20 minutes seems to be the going, the going pattern. Okay, if you found this video useful, fantastic. I have a whole bunch of videos on strongholds, how to build them. You're welcome to go and check them out. If you are a dungeon master or a player and you want advice or video content on other topics regarded, regarding Dungeons and Dragons, then I have plenty of videos on those topics. You're welcome to go and check those out. You want to support the channel? great. You can do that through Patreon. You can use the affiliate links to the book depository and Amazon down in the description. I have a merchandise shelf underneath all of my videos where you can buy merch or you just watch my videos. I get paid um, AdSense revenue as long as you don't have a, an ad blocker running. Okay. And till next time, keep rolling those 20s. I'm not gone. My voice was giving out though. For some reason, my voice was just about uh, toast. All right, so I need to get busy. I'm going to go through the chat. I'm going to try to go as fast as I can. Let's see if my eyes are any good today. Uh, oh, this is this is an improvement. Usually, I put them on, and nothing happens. Ha ha! We're in we're in business. Glasses that actually work today. I'm so happy. All right, so. I've already said hi to a whole lot of people. That was Sam, Tom, Miller, Nicholas, uh, Cameron, John Jones, uh, Chances D and D spell book. Like I said, go check out his channel. Um, who else we got here? Uh, I've said hi to Scott. Bam, bam, bam. Chuck in your stuff because I'm not going to hang around if I get to the bottom of the chat and you haven't put in your question. It doesn't have to be about today's topic. It can be about anything. I don't care. Uh, as long as I can figure out how to answer the question, I will answer it. <clears throat> uh, Nicholas is correct, magic socks. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, yeah, you're right. Okay, so we, we've established that um, magic socks do exist in, in the real world. <laughs> I'm glad you like the artwork. It took me a long time. I was starting to have um, heart palpitations. There was so much stuff to c compile for this video. I think sometimes I get a little bit carried away and try to do too much all at once. Um, <laughs> what's that, Carl? They aren't trap detectors. Yes, I, I think that using your hireling to go in front of the party to, to step on the traps or activate the traps for you is really going to wind up going down badly. You're going to get a reputation as being an individual that nobody wants to work for because everybody dies who goes with you. So um, as a dungeon master, I would certainly be inclined to have people not want to be hired by them, no matter how much they pay, if they thought they were going to wind up um, paste uh, on the wall or on the floor. 
for whatever reason. Uh, DABs, all right, okay. Hi, Fred, how's it going? Fred Hubbers here. Uh, not as late getting here as usual. Well, I'm, I'm glad you made it. Usually you, you never make it quite on time and we've just about finished. <laughs> uh, what's that? The the lackey or the um, Sherpa? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I guess you could say that. I mean, you could call it a Sherpa. I mean, call it whatever you like. It doesn't matter. What do you got here, Fred? Our links can be looked at as um, meat shield. See, and I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily fall for that. I, as a dungeon master, I'm inclined to attack hirelings first, but if you use them as a meat shield, you're going to go through them very quickly. Um, spare PCs in case one dies. Uh, campsite security. Yep, absolutely. All things I've already talked about, aka the red shirt in Star Trek. Exactly. That's what the reference was. The red shirt is the Star Trek reference. Uh, I am partly um, nerd, so uh, those references will come out, unfortunately. I do apologise. Hi, Cameron. Uh, dogs make great campsite guards. They are um, light sleepers, exactly. Uh, they can detect things much further away, absolutely. And, of course, they're not just using sight. They can use smell. They can smell them coming. <clears throat> okay, what else? Uh, hi, Scott. What do you got here? Dogs' biggest uh, attribute is its nose, exactly. That's that's what I was thinking as well. Um, in a world with dragons and wild magic, I can't see why some parties don't realise that. Well, I mean, you know, I think the, the reality is that a lot of people... It's a game. It's a fantasy game. And a lot of the things that we think of trying to do in our fantasy games aren't completely obvious to us because we're not really in the real world. If we were actually going camping we were and we had a dog we would take the dog with us because if you leave the dog at home you've got to leave it with somebody to look after and actually a dog in a bush is actually quite useful uh, for a number of different reasons also they can do a lot of damage but um, but very useful particularly if you're hunting or needing to track something or you don't want to get lost uh, what are you overboard dm okay so overboard dm has a channel as well Miniatures, terrain, go check his stuff out. It's pretty good. I'm at work tonight. Oh, oh my gosh, mate. Don't get yourself into trouble. I'm glad you liked the video, um, Nicholas. I'm glad it worked out for, for you. I was trying really hard, and don't freak out. There will be more on the topic. I just haven't been... I can't cover everything. Just the basics. Exactly, Fred. Pretty good coverage of just the basics. That's what we're trying to get. I wouldn't say it's short, mate. I think that's almost 20 minutes, um, Brad. But thank you for saying that it was short. <laughs> yeah, I did put on glasses. The, the They are actually working today, Fred. Um, usually I put my glasses on and nothing actually functions. It's like my eyes change from day to day. Uh, a product of getting older, I guess. What do you got here, Brad? So just wanted to give a, a quick shout out. I just finished DMing my first adventure, Lost Mon of Fandelva. Um, and your guides were amazing. I am glad you have been enjoying those guides, Brad. Uh, for those of you who are still waiting on the Dragon of Icebire Peak, uh, it's going to be a little while before I can get videos out on that topic. As I said, my players are watching my videos on those topics, so I have to stop making them till they've finished. Okay? <laughs> and they're not finished yet. We're still working our way through it. I have learned all sorts of interesting things about that adventure, though. And uh, a few things about the Lost Mine Fandalf and how it might tie in. But we'll see how we go. Okay, chances DM Spellbook. You have a question. Um, have you had a chance to check out Pathfinder 2E? Okay, all right, so I'm going to make it clear right now. I've played Dungeons & Dragons 2nd Ed Edition, but I didn't use all the rules. I've played Dungeons & Dragons 3.5. I didn't really play the third version. I went straight to 3.5 because um, there was a sort of a, a, a gap in between. Then I played 4E, I've played 5E, but when 3.5 got discontinued and Paizo decided to make Pathfinder, which essentially is just Dungeons & Dragons 3.5 with a few modifications, um, I was quite happy because I was getting sick and tired of Dungeons & Dragons 3.5 and then I went to Pathfinder and I thought I would be happy there and I wasn't. That doesn't mean that Dungeons & Dragons 4E made me happy. 
So as a result, I have had a small look at Pathfinder 2e. And all of the things that put me off before still exist. Um, if I had my way, I would have stripped down Dungeons & Dragons 5e so that the engine was so much simpler and that you could run three different types of games. One for absolute basics. One for the core players. And one for more advanced where you would tack on more rules. So that means there would be like three stages of playing the game, but essentially all of them would be tied together and it would just be a matter of I guess it would be a matter of playing the game with a car with just an engine and no shell, and then playing the game with the shell on, you know, the with all the panels in place, and then playing the next version of the game where you have the interior and some seats to sit in. <laughs> and that's really what I wanted. And uh, so for me, Pathfinder 2e, I'm, I'm, I'm not really that interested in playing it. So if you wanted to know... I'm probably never going to do a review on Pathfinder 2e. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I, I'm a, a minimalist. I like less rather than more um, because I want my game to be more about using your imagination, being clever rather than people looking at rule books and at character sheets for mechanics on it. It's just not my thing. Okay. Okay, Nicholas, what do you got here? Lost Mona Fandelva Guides and the Tyranny of Dragons reviews are awesome. Well, I'm glad that you liked the Tyranny of Dragons review and the Lost Mona Fandelva Guides. Um, I did a couple of videos on Horde of the Dragon Queen and a little bit on the Rise of Tiamat. I haven't done any more on them because I'm just not invested in them, as a, as a matter of fact. I just, I'm just not, they were... It's like old stuff, and I don't know if I'm going to chase it later or not. It just depends. I, I never know what I'm going to do sometimes. Yeah, we don't want we don't don't want the um, <clears throat> the murder hobos in the in the party um, having too much of fun, do we? <laughs> yeah, there was a joke. There was a joke involved here. Yeah, there, there's usually if if there's no jokes in my videos, then um, either I'm having a really bad day. Or you've missed something. Nicholas, I don't think that Dungeons & Dragons 5e isn't awesome. I think it is a very good game. But, just what I have to say about it. Anyway, what do you got here? John Jones. When my PCs throw away an NPC hiling, I like to weave a, uh, a family member into the story. Oh, hello, I'm, I'm listening, John. Um, the, rich, the rich father in the next town now wants the party dead. ha, 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 ha. Oh, awesome. I love it. That's a good idea. There needs to be consequences. And I don't mean I don't mean um, horrible, nasty consequences, but there do need to be consequences for doing things with your character in the game. Um, okay, doggies are awesome. Yes, doggies are awesome. I love dogs. I'm not so fond on cats, but dogs are great. Is your theme music uh, in an original composition? Matt, my theme music is a, basically it is a free, so when you see that intro, it's a free piece of music that was uh, acquired by an individual who made the intro for me as a, I could basically as a favor. Um, so I don't have to pay anybody for using it. So I don't really I don't really use a lot of music because if I'm using music, people aren't listening to what I have to say. And I know um, there's a generation who like the idea that I have music running in the background while I'm talking. But that just drives me nuts. Um, so I don't do that sort of thing. It's enough it's hard enough to get good sound when you sit in a tiny office like I do as it is. So I don't want to mess with it. Um, the glasses note was a timestamp. Oh, was it? <laughs> All right, thanks. Chances D and D spellbook. Very interesting insight. Thank you so much. You're welcome, Chances. Yeah, it's it's not that I have not played these games. I have. I just my my preference is less rather than more um, mechanics as such. 
Smash Bro 99. Hey bud, how's it going? How have I been? Well, um, I'm trying not to go insane. Uh, I'm still working, which is good. Always nice. So <laughs> it's it's a product of just keep plotting on, keep doing what you need to do, right? And try to have some part of your week that's for you so you can continue sort of doing the same thing day after day. Um, but yeah, I have been working right through the lockdown and the pandemic, if that's what your question was uh, about uh, Smash Bro. All right, Scott, I need to have a drink of water. I'm almost to the bottom of that um, chat uh, chat line, and as soon as we get to the bottom, I'm gone. <clears throat> I am trying to bash it out fast today, aren't I? That's not to say that I don't want to answer questions about any aspect of Dungeons & Dragons. That's not true at all. Okay, Scott, I'm a minimalist as well, uh, too. I only use the core books unless I am playing Adventurers League. So here's, here's something I would like to just tell people if they were wondering how I play uh, in Dungeons & Dragons. When I Dungeon Master, I try not to have too many resources available for my players all at once. I try to sort of keep it a limit on things. One, because I don't want to have to carry a lot of stuff around. Two, so I don't have to track a lot of new stuff and don't have to figure out how to adjust things all the time. When I am a player, when I play as a character, when it comes to what books I use, I almost exclusively just use the player's handbook and nothing else. Now, why? Because my characters aren't really based on the mechanics of the game. Uh, most of my characters are based on something else that's going on. One, I am a cog in the machine as far as I'm concerned. The cog is part of the machine. The machine is the party. And sometimes I just build my character around that. But there's always something else going on as well. Whether that be a, a dynamic within the party, and usually not one that's destructive. I've done that in the past. I've done the, the naughty things. Um... But now I try to sort of enjoy the game on a different level um, and I try to figure out how to use things and get things done without just doing the same old thing, which is usually look down at the character sheet and what do I have? Uh, which is why you will see that series on Dungeons and Dragons adventuring gear, because I think that's a really important aspect of the game. Does that mean that I'm in max? Sometimes I do, and sometimes I don't. It really depends. Sometimes I do, and sometimes I don't. Okay, so that's uh, that's the little, that little kernel from me, revealing. I'm not I'm not huge on character builds. Okay, I will say that I will talk about the coffee lock at some point. I will do a video on the coffee lock. For those of you who know what that is, I will do probably at least two videos on the coffee lock. Um, and yes, there are more videos on Dungeons and Dragons adventuring gear. What am I going to be doing? I think it's time to talk about the torch. <laughs> I think a lot of people forget how useful the torch is, but that's for another day. Okay. Um, chances DD spellbook. How are you finding channel growth these days? Channel growth has been very, very slow. Uh, but channel revenue has increased. It went through, it went, it sunk like, it dropped like a rock. Um, chances, if that's what you were wondering. It, and that happened, to, I think, to a lot of channels. Um, I know I noticed it. I know I was talking to AJ Pickett and he said he was expecting that to happen. Um, but he wasn't worried because he had enough revenue coming from other, um, other sources. It's not my full-time job. This is just a hobby for me. So I don't have to worry about that sort of thing um, these days. Okay, it's not my it's not my sole income, um, but things are improving, and I think that's a good thing. Even if the number of subscribers doesn't grow, because only about twenty percent of people who watch my videos are subscribed to my channel, the other eighty percent are not subscribed to my channel. 
And as a result, they probably won't ever get notified. They have to, I have to produce a video that they are interested in every single time. Does that make sense? Um, okay, so, so that's what's going on for me, chances. Matt, um, I was thinking the music with the, um, the basins and string from other videos. Yeah, I know what you're talking about, Matt. Uh, that was made by, um, oh, for the life of me, why have I managed to forget his name? Craig. Craig made that video for me, and he selected the music and the image, images and so forth. He built that all him, for me, okay? Yeah. I still have a job, and yes, I will try to stay safe. Um, if you are min-maxing for combat, you are not really playing, paying attention to the story. <clears throat> it depends. If if you are playing with a dungeon master who whose focus is more combat or is building the adventure around combat, then that, that's going to be fine. Um, but I, I like to have a mix. I like the idea of a bit of variety. And nowadays, I run my combats really fast like really quick. Does that make sense? So I have special rules for running combat, which basically uh, consist of, I put everybody into order. I usually get them to roll initiatives, multiple initiatives before we even start. And then when we come to the, our combat, I will do them in blocks, you know? Um, if there are three characters before my monsters, then those three characters, whoever goes first or gets in there first, takes their turn. I just get it done as quickly as I can. As a result, combats go much faster, much more interesting, and I can see the players making interesting decisions about what they should do. <clears throat> and I spend a lot less time waiting around for people to make a, um, a choice. Uh, okay, so a drink of water. <clears throat> I almost got to the bottom there. I almost got to the bottom. <clears throat> okay, so Brent. Um, hey, Fred. Been watching your videos for a long time. Keep up the good work. I am trying to, certainly trying really hard to. Um, question, what's your favorite class to play to at least level 10? Okay, um, I'll, I'll tell you. <clears throat> There's actually two classes that I like playing to level 10. I, I really love playing the wizard. For... The fact that it can do so much, and it is horrifically, particularly at higher levels, it's it's it can do anything. It really can. It can do anything. So wizard is definitely there, Brent. But, and I know a lot of people will be confused. I love playing the monk, and yeah, I know it's suboptimal quite often, but the reality is that I love. The top end, which is the wizard as far as I'm concerned, because if anything's overpowered, it's a wizard. And if anything is underpowered, it's probably the monk. Um, with, I would say, the ranger or certain varieties of ranger coming in there somewhere. But, you know, there's a lot of subclasses now that make all the difference. That's Those are my favourites. Monk and wizard. I've never made a wizard monk, but I have made a, <laughs> uh, a cleric wizard, which I highly recommend, um, <laughs> but it is, it's pretty broken as far as I'm concerned. Um, <laughs> you, can, you do dominate the table a bit when you do that sort of thing. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So um, I got Brent's question out. John, what do you got here? Uh, didn't you talk about the torch with um, general equipment? I did. John, you're right. You have been paying attention. Uh, we talked for 10 minutes about what would happen if you dropped the torch on wet in a wet dungeon. We did. But John, I have much more on the torch. Not just that, because I got people to respond to that, right? I have a whole bunch more on the torch, which I think you will find incredibly useful. That's just me, okay? Uh, okay, so, um, yes, Ugly Weirdo, I did get back to teaching, but not in the way that I wanted. Um, I, I've kind of been tricked into a job. I, they said it was one thing, and it's actually something else, which I've been trying to avoid, and I am still looking to get out of that job. But it pays well, it's very stressful, 
I have to sleep a lot <laughs> and I have a lot less time and as a result you might have noticed that I don't do quite as much content on my channel or that there are different things going on you know it's a little bit harder for me to make it all roll um, and yes I am I'm quite eager to move on to a different job rather than the one I'm doing but it's paying the bills and the mortgage is shrinking very quickly <laughs> okay uh, you're welcome, Chances. Uh, Joshua. Hi, Joshua. How's it going? Um, how do you incorporate magic items, homebrew, or or DMG? I really use the DMG as it seems to only be rare artifacts. Okay, so magic items, homebrew. <clears throat> Here's the thing with homebrew. If I were to tell you some of the items that I've made as homebrew, I would say easily uh, quite a lot of them are quite peculiar they do very strange things about 90% of what I was making was cursed uh, I guess because I was sick and tired of every magic item only having an advantage for the player's character sometimes I just wanted something weird to happen so as a result I made a lot of cursed magic items my approach to magic items I've actually done Joshua a lot of videos on the topic already like how to make them um, incorporating magic items my own personal approach to magic items I haven't talked about because I don't honestly believe that people would be interested frankly I think because I, I did so much magic item creation when I, the game first came out um, and I did a whole lot, I created a whole lot of stuff I allowed my players to make a whole lot of stuff uh, I'm kind of spent on doing that now that means as a result I'm, I'm, I'm not quite so invested in magic item creation and homebrew um, if people, if enough people hound me that I should do that, then yes, I will talk about magic items and how what sort of things I have made before. But it wouldn't be a, you know, how much do they cost, how much, how to make them, because I've done those videos, and other aspects of magic items. It would be, I guess, what I personally did. Does that make sense? Because I don't think I've got anything else to say about it that I, I feel like talking about these days. Anyway. <clears throat> Hi Brent, how's it going? Um, before you say my guess is wizard, yeah, all right. Well, I, it's wizard. Why have I not done more vid with videos on wizard? I actually have done a lot of videos on wizard. I've done a lot of spell videos. If you haven't noticed, I did a whole bunch. Um, we talk D and D, the Tempest cleric. I, I actually like combining the cleric and the wizard. Uh, because the cleric is a very powerful class. Monk is my favourite, followed by druid. Yeah, I, I've never... Look, I, I played a druid not so long ago, and uh, I was appalled at what you could do with it. <laughs> it's, it's a very powerful class. If, if you build it a particular way, it's a very powerful class. But did I enjoy playing the druid? My party were happy that I was. But I didn't really enjoy it as much as the wizard and the monk. I just like to blow things up and burn things and punch things in the face. That's generally how I, I play my game. <laughs> okay, overboard DM. What do you got here, Joe? Uh, what gives you the most enjoyment from DMing? Uh, for me, it's everyone smiling and laughing and having a great time around the table. That's, that's it for me, Joe. Um, I like to shock my players. I did that recently. Uh, I won't share too much about that because I will eventually talk about that anyway. But as a result of some of the things that I've incorporated into the game, I like to surprise my players with very peculiar things and do things they weren't expecting. So, And I, I want them to still smile and laugh and have a good time. So absolutely, that's the thing that I'm very interested in. Does that mean I will always run a game exactly the player in a way that the player wants? No, I don't really do that. I don't really make adventures or run adventures or incorporate anything into them 
that is always going to be tailored to players because I need to have something for myself. Okay. Janshevik, hi, how's it going? Yes, that's right. Chances D and D spellbook is here, and so is the overboard DM. Hi, Cameron. What do you got here, Cameron? Um, I enjoy the the bard and the rogue. Okay, I've played a a combination of bard and uh, a couple of other classes. I guess the thing that upsets what I get upset about with regard to the bard is they have garbage cantrips available, uh, and after that, they have a, a huge, I mean, the selection of spells is pretty good for a bard. It's it's very versatile. Um, but I guess one of the things I find frustrating about the bard is it's just not me, you know? I just don't get into that particular character. That doesn't mean that I don't think it's a good cam, um, character class because it can certainly be a very good character class. <clears throat> We talk D and D overboard the party's enjoyment. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, the party party enjoyment is certainly a big factor. Nicholas agrees. He he's the same on the same page. Um, what are your thoughts on grid versus zone combat style? Okay, so when you're talking about the grid, you're talking about your one inch squares or your hexes or um, your twenty five millimeter square depending on what country you come from, right? And what measurement style you're using. Okay, I, I like using the grid sometimes. Uh, there are other times where I just don't care about it and I just want to use theater of the mind. Now, when you say zone combat style, zone combat style, if I understand, goes back to fate. Fate is a, a, a it's not an elaborate game system. But you can do a lot with it, um, and that's where the concept of combat zones or um, uh, zones comes into play. So I know what you're talking about because I've played Fate and I've played Bulldogs, and uh, those games use a zone process rather than an actual grid as such. Does that make sense? I think they both have their place. I use them for very specific purposes. I like zone combat style because I'm playing online and not in person. It is actually much easier for me to use theater of the mind or the zone combat style, you might say, rather than try to use a mid, um, a grid. A mid? What is a mid? There's no such thing as a mid. It's a grid. Okay? Squares. Okay? But with that, even with that, even playing online with webcam and microphone, using Skype or whatever else we can get to actually work <laughs> and, it, and that everybody actually can support on their systems. Um, I still use a grid sometimes. I point the camera at the grid. I just turn it down and point that down and when we're finished I bring it back up to my face so that they can see when I'm talking and, and what's going on. Okay, Because I think that's a big factor. Facial contact in the game of Dungeons and Dragons is actually really important. Whole body language is even more important, but you can't get that online. All right, <clears throat> um, 100, Don. I'm not sure what that means, um, Don. I'm gonna take that as a big positive though. Um, F Hubba, what do you got here? My favorite homebrew items are kitchen gadgets and plays on the the old Ron Palal. Oh gosh, my eyes have gone funny again. Popalal, Popalal commercials. I don't know. I don't know what they are. Pocket fisherman becomes a ring of um, of fishing. Oh, okay. Why not? It's it's cool. Yeah, mine have done a lot a little bit more um, of other things, but yeah, like I said, I, they, they tend to be more of a cursed nature. <laughs> the problem with the cleric wizard is that uh, you must invest uh, two mental stats. It's it's difficult to do, but can be done with a half elf. I actually found the half elf to be much more user friendly with regard to splitting up your resources. So as a result, I went with the half elf uh, for that purpose. 
Uh, Joshua, what do you got here? What camp campaign settings have you played that aren't your own? Uh, what is your favorite and least favorite? Personally, I love Eberron. Okay, so what have I played? Forgotten Realms. Yes. Um, I've played uh, Dark Sun. Yes. Spelljammer. Yes. Um, uh, Netheril. I think it's called Netheril. It's it's the it's the campaign setting that we used to use in Dungeons and Dragons 4E. So I've used that that campaign setting. I've used the the Pathfinder um, game setting. I've played in games like that. I haven't run games with it necessarily, um, but I've certainly played in those. I haven't played in Eberron. I haven't played in any of the Magic the Gathering settings. So those are the settings that I've certainly utilized. Um, which is my favorite? Personally, my favorite is Dark Sun rather than Eberron. But what I've found is my interest in Dark Sun is not followed up by the player's enthusiasm. As a result, it's a, it's a rough world. So as a result, I don't usually try to go back to running Dark Sun, even though it's like, it's an itch I want to scratch. Does that make sense? So that's, that's sort of my, my favorite out of all of them. Um, what else did I have I used? I, I used Greyhawk at one point, didn't I? Yeah, I did. Yeah, I used some of the older adventures and we used Greyhawk um, campaign setting. So yeah, those are the things that I've sort of used. I may have missed something, forgotten something, but those are the ones I remember. Cameron, what do you got here? Um, zero, zero. What about prestidigitation, the insult, uh, the insult one that deal, what? The insult one that deals 1d4 psychic damage. Vicious mockery, yeah. Your prestidigitation is a good cantrip, but they don't really get that many. And vicious mockery, I, I don't really like vicious mockery. I really, I didn't like it. I never really found anything that, I will do a video on the best cantrips for bards at some point. I believe, I believe that's supposed to be coming up at some point because of the uh, the poll that I put out. Wizards were at the top. I think Bards followed by the Warlock. I don't understand why people are so concerned about the Warlock. Warlock's pretty simple if you ask me. Um, but yeah. We'll talk about all that sort of stuff some other time. Okay. Um, what do you got here, Joe? I'm pretty sure he doesn't like um, like Out of the Abyss and Horde of the Dragon Queen. Yeah. Uh, okay, so... Here's the thing, Joe. You're right. I don't like Horde of the Dragon Queen. I really don't. I like the Rise of Tiamat. That adventure was great, but my players were unprepared for dealing with negotiation. Um, as for Out of the Abyss, the adventure itself, I dislike. The NPCs in the adventure, Out of the Abyss, are brilliant. Um, the gold, I, I think they're wonderful. But the adventure itself, I just did not like it. Not even remotely. I didn't like the beginning, I didn't really like the middle, and I didn't like the end. Nothing felt right. Uh, as a result, I've never run out of the abyss. <laughs> <clears throat> Which is kind of a shame. <clears throat> uh, Janshevik, what do you got here? Half elf is not that good. It gets um, boosted in uh, a dump stat for that build. Well, I found that the half health worked perfectly well for me. Um, we can disagree on that one. But uh, yeah, I found that to be quite useful. And I'm, I don't, honestly, I don't really like playing humans. Okay, I'm already human. I want to play something else. Um, that doesn't mean you can't make humans interesting, but I want my world to be a bit more fantastical. I want different races. I don't want to see just a world that's, predominantly just human so um, I would you know if I'm going to create something I want to make something that's a little bit out of the box uh, yes Scott yes the brutality of Dark Sun it is definitely a dangerous place Jean Paul Jean Paul is one of my players um, as I said they do watch my videos 
Hi AJ, AJ Pickett's in the house, make sure you go and check out his channel, you're probably already watching him anyway. <laughs> uh, what do you got here Fred? Yes, Dark Sun um, books, yeah, I don't know, I, it's not so, I don't know what it is about Dark Sun, I guess it brings me back, and makes me think about Mad Max, um, the Mad Max movies, and um, an apocalypse, and I like that idea. I, I always wanted to have like a Dark Sun campaign where the players went from low level right through to a higher level and they rebuilt the world. Do you know what I mean? Uh, because the, the world is dying. I really wanted them to be able to rebuild and change Dark Sun to something else. Uh, you guys are making me talk and we're into an hour. I'm, I'm, I'm going to get to the bottom of this chat. Don't you worry. Uh, what have you got here? We Talk d and Horde of the Dragon Queen was fine for the first few chapters, but the uh, the travel sucked. Yeah, you're right on the dot there. I had the same experience. What I found bizarre is that uh, my players thought the adventure was great, but I did not enjoy it. <laughs> so, so, so as a result, I've been not really inclined to talk beyond episode three because we get into episode four on Horde of the Dragon Queen and it's on the road and that's where it all just fell apart. The only other part of the adventure I really like is the climax, the very last chapter. Everything else I don't care for. You enjoy playing female red-haired humans. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> oh dear. Uh, with a background in music and academics oh, okay all right Nicholas I'm not sure what that I was related to so I've I kind of missed what it was supposed to be connected to but anyway he was completing the chat about the the hirelings part of the stream ah okay all right all right okay I've got to the bottom I got to the bottom of the chat which I think is fantastic which means I can go and have some food and have a rest uh, what sort of videos will you see in the future I think the common adventuring torch is very likely. I think that I will probably do a video on dungeon master screens. I've done so many. Why not enough? Why not more? <laughs> I know. Um, I will probably do a video on. Should I even tell you what it is? I linked up with some guys in Florida. And we actually managed to make it work. I have editing I have to go and do. And you probably already know, I despise editing. But, uh, as a result, we did some topics on something I really like. And they really like. And that's coming. <laughs> For those of you who are here, it's coming. Um, okay, yeah. There is a lot of assumptions that the, the players are just going to travel vast distances on these <laughs> slim clues in Storm King's um, Storm King's Thunder. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. It's yeah, it's kind of railroady. Um, yeah, I understand. I mean, uh, Storm King's Thunder has got a whole bunch of other problems that Tour of the Dragon um, Queen doesn't. But um, hopefully, I'll get through the Dragon of Ice Spire Peak. And then after I've done that, we'll move on into uh, Dungeon of the Mad Mage. That is hopefully what is going to happen. And it, wouldn't it be nice if um, I had something useful to say, I don't often have a lot to say, had something useful to say about Dungeon of the Mad Mage. Wouldn't it even be nicer if I could link up with somebody else who also does YouTube videos on monster lore regarding, I don't know, Under Mountain? Okay, that's all I'm saying. I've, uh, I've said enough. <laughs> I get a, I've got to get out of here. I have to go, otherwise I'm going to lose my voice. Mm, Under Mountain. AJ Pickett likes the idea of Under Mountain. I like the idea of Under Mountain. I feel like that that's something that would be um, very good. Hey, thank you, Overboard DM. Thank you, Joe. I do appreciate it. Okay, um, I've said enough, um, haven't I? I? I'll shut up now, AJ. All right, I'm, uh, I'm going to sign out.
and get out of here because I do need to actually um, have some food because I haven't eaten. <laughs> so wherever you are in the world, whether it be the morning, the afternoon, the night, the early morning, which it could be, uh, make sure to look after yourself, your family, your friends and your neighbours. Just keep your distance, particularly if they're coughing and spluttering. It's probably just the flu or the cold anyway. And then, hey, till next time, keep rolling those 20s.